Welcome, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. We are so glad to have you with us this morning for a behind the scenes look inside our fossil lab. This is the first of four special webinars to explore our fossil lab. So ask your teacher or caregiver to make sure you're registered for all of these awesome experiences. My name is Becca and I work with the education team here at Librea Tar Pits. And as you can probably tell, I am not at the museum right now. I'm at home like many of you, but we do have some amazing staff that still need to go inside the museum to help take care of our fossils. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can and Steph might answer a lot of them during her presentation. But if we don't get to answer your question today, I encourage you to write it down so you can learn more about our lab on your own or maybe have a chance to ask your question at one of our other sessions. So if you'd like, you can grab a piece of paper and a pencil so you can record your experience while you're watching today. You can note down any of those questions that you have, maybe a few facts you learned, or draw or write a description of what the Fossil Lab looks like. And we love fan art of our program, so if you have a picture you'd like to share with your teacher, they're always welcome to email us at school programs um, to share with us. So today we have Steph Potts, who is originally from South Africa. She's been working at the Tarpon since 2016, and she's the manager of the Fossil Lab. She's going to give us an overview of everything that happens after we excavate. So hi, Steph. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Becca. Hello, friends. Hello. Well, go ahead, Steph. Tell us all about it. Thank, thank you, Becca, and hello, friends. I hope you're all doing, uh, staying safe and healthy. And as Becca mentioned, we still have to come into the museum every now and again just to make sure all our fossils are doing well and being taken care of. And because of that, I'm the only person in the lab today, so I'm not wearing a mask while doing this presentation with you. But I'm extremely excited to share with all of you what it is that we do here inside the fossil lab. Before I go into all the technical details of exactly how we prepare the fossils in this space, I just want to give you a brief overview on what it is that we are actually working on in this space. So you'll notice behind me, I have a collection of models and some bones or fossils that you can see that represent some of the extinct megafauna that we work with here in the lab. We have the saber-toothed cat with its extremely impressive canines, quite the iconic fossils for Rancho La Brea or the Tarpets. We have the Harlan's ground sloth, direwolf, which is our most common occurring species of mammal here with over 4,000 individuals found up to date. And then over here, we have the lower jaw. So just for comparison, this is the lower jaw of the mammoth. So you can see how large it is. And the mammoth is the largest mammal we find here at the Tarpets. Our fossils that we have here date anywhere between 10 to 50,000 years in age. And what makes the La Brea Tarpets such a unique place is that this is the only place in the world with such a large collection of Ice Age fossils. We have over three and a half million specimens in our collection, something that we don't have anywhere else in the world. Now you might be wondering, why is it that the Tarpets has such a rich collection of Ice Age fossils? And the reason for this is actually the asphalt, or what is commonly referred to as the tar. So the asphalt we find here at the Tarpets is actually the compressed, and heated ancient remains of sea plankton when Los Angeles used to be part of the ocean. And what happens over time, heat um, and pressure and, uh, uh, compacts this plankton and converts it into oil. Los Angeles is also very tectonically active with earthquakes. And what happens is when the earth moves, it allows this oil to seep up through these cracks and surfaces to the land. And once it makes contact with the atmosphere, what happens is the heavier elements of crude oil dissipates into the air, uh, uh, the lighter elements dissipate into the air, and the heavier elements stay behind in the form of this sticky, gooey, viscous asphalt or tar. Now, 
the way that the animals got trapped here or collected here for us to find the fossils is through a process or method called entrapment. So what would happen is as they were walking on the surface of the land, there might have been some leaves or water on top of the asphalt and they wouldn't have seen it. And when they stepped into it, got stuck in the asphalt and thereby trapped in the asphalt and eventually became the fossils preserved in the asphalt that we work on today. Now, just to make sure that you understand how the asphalt worked, it wasn't like quicksand where they would step in and sink into the asphalt. There's a, it's not a very deep layer of asphalt, but it's strong and sticky enough to trap animals, even as massive and large as the mammoths. Now, the La Brea Tarpids is also what's called a carnivore bias site, which means that we have an unnaturally high degree of carnivore animals here versus herbivore animals. So carnivores are animals that like to eat meat, where herbivores are plant-eating animals. And the reason most likely for that is because when a herbivore like a sloth or a mammoth got trapped in the asphalt, they could have been calling out um, to, for help to get free, and carnivores would have been attracted by these sounds, and they would have tried to consume these herbivores stuck in the asphalt, and in turn, they too got stuck in the asphalt. It also helps to understand why dire wolves would have been our most common occurring species of mammal. Dire wolves are social animals, or we believe they were social animals like wolves today, which means they would have hunted in packs. So when there was one mammoth or one sloth stuck in the asphalt calling out, several dire wolves would have come to try and feast on its remains. So that's just a brief background on why we have these fossils and why this collection is so unique. But we're not the only place in the world to have asphalt fossil sites. It's very rare. It's not a common occurring way of fossil preservation, but we have identified around 12 sites all over the world that have fossil deposits. We actually have three fossil sites here in California that are of asphaltic preservation. Um, it's the uh, La Brea Tarpids here in Los Angeles, and then we have Carpenteria and McKittrick higher up, close to Santa Barbara. So here at the Tarpids in Los Angeles, we have done a lot of research into the material that we have and the fossils and the science, but we also do research into the preparation. Cleaning or preparing fossils that have been preserved in asphalt is a very challenging way of trying to get fossils ready for study by scientists. And so in some extent, it has become a science in itself to learn how to work with this asphalt, sticky asphalt, and how to preserve the fossils that have been um, found in asphalt deposits. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you what a bone usually looks like when we receive it from our excavation team. So this specimen I'm holding up here is the shoulder blade or scapula of a die wolf. It's got a piece broken out over here, but otherwise it's a pretty complete specimen. Now you'll notice that it is encrusted with this black sediment or matrix. Matrix is a term we use that refers to a collection of sand, pebbles, biological and organic material that got trapped in the asphalt and preserved around this larger specimen like the direwolf scapula. But one thing you'll notice is that it's not sticky or gooey as one would think. And the reason for that is because this has been excavated a while ago. It's been taken out of the ground for a while. And what happens is it oxidizes or dries out over time. Now, when the lab receives this, we have to turn this firm matrix back into a liquid format so that we can remove it easily without causing any damage to the larger fossil, but also because we want to be very careful with what could be inside this matrix because there could be almost hundreds of remains of little smaller micro uh, material or fossils in here, such as rodents or plants but I'll talk to you about that a little later in the presentation. So what do we do to remove this asphalt? 
Well, we use a degreasing solvent. We are currently using a degreasing solvent called N-propyl bromide, but we're also investigating another solvent called Novec 73DE. And what is the so degreasing solvent? So what it is, it's like our magic liquid that we use here in the lab. And what it does is it breaks down the oil component in the asphalt, because remember I told you, asphalt is a byproduct of crude oil. And what it does is it breaks down the oil component in the asphalt, thereby allowing us to reliquify the asphalt. So when we are working with the solvent, we use a variety of different tools for the job because we have different kinds of fossils and some fossils in different degrees of preservation. Some might be perfectly preserved um, where they're almost complete and others could be preserved like that dye wolf that I showed you where it's got a portion net missing and we have to be very careful with how we work with these individual fossils. And so I'm going to show you some of these tools and you might recognize them as well. We often like to use the toothbrush and yes we do use this to brush the teeth of our dye wolves and saber tooth cats. We use q-tips we like to use Q-tips because the cotton threads really grab on um, to, to the asphalt when you're cleaning it. But we have to be very careful because we don't want to use Q-tips where we have jagged edges, where bone has been broken like here, because those cotton fibers could grab onto those edges and we can actually cause more harm to the fossil. In instances like this, we like to use these delicate foam tip applicators. So it's got a Q-tip underneath, but it's got this very soft foam covering, which doesn't grab onto anything. And this is the ideal tool to use when we are working with fossils that are, are broken or damaged or have jagged edges. We also like to use toothpicks. Toothpicks are great. We actually do use it when we are picking some of the matrix out around the teeth of our animals but it's also great to go into tiny areas where our bigger tools can't get in to remove some of that asphalt or matrix if we need to expose something in the skeleton that is important to the scientists for study. Here we have another one of those foam tip applicators. This is just a smaller one, again, to allow us access into tiny crevices and nooks and crannies in the bone. And then we also use our multi-tool, the paintbrush. We use this both for um, preparation of solvent, but we also use it when we sort our microfossils. And I'll explain this to you when we get to the microfossil portion. And then most importantly, lab safety. So we have to wear our safety goggles when we are working with the solvent and also our gloves. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a brief uh, example of how the solvent uh, reacts with the asphalt so that you can get a better understanding of what it is that I'm talking about. But before I do that, I just want to show off the specimen I'm going to be using for this example. And this is an American badger. This is a skull that has been recently found from Project 23. And it's quite a remarkable find because we don't have a lot of American badger in our collection. So it's interesting that we have a large representation of extinct mammals in our collection, but we only have very few of uh, modern representatives like the badger, raccoon, uh, and weasels, although we do have a lot of coyotes in our collection. So you can see my foam tip applicator is unused. I'm going to be dipping it into the solvent and I'm applying it to the asphalt. And as you can see, it's a very slow and gradual pr process. Again, we want to be careful because we don't know what microfossils might be trapped inside this asphaltic matrix, but also you might have recognized that there's a lot of cracks in the skull. So I want to be super delicate to ensure that I do not separate these and try and keep it in as it's much of its original state as possible. Now you can see the tool. You can notice how that solvent liquefied the asphalt and what's happened in turn is that the foam has absorbed that liquid asphalt. 
and I'll continue doing this until this specimen is clean. An example of what the specimen looks like when it's been completely prepared of asphalt. This is the thoracic vertebra of a saber tooth cat. So the thoracic vertebra is the vertebra to which all your ribs connect, or your thorax, and that's why it's got these little shelves on the side so that the ribs can rest on that. Here we have an impressive saber tooth cat canine. A portion of the tip is unfortunately not preserved, but you can see it is all clear of that matrix and ready to be sent through to collections to make it accessible for our staff to study. And once we have removed all of that asphaltic matrix and we've removed and liquefied that asphalt, what we end up with is just sediment. You can see the sediment now no longer has any asphalt in it. And it's just like loose sand, we've got some pebbles, and we've got some remains of bones of tiny animals and plants in this. But we deal with this separately because working with sediment requires us to use microscopes so that we can get a better visual of what we are seeing in there and able to extract even the tiniest microfossils for our researchers to study. Sometimes what happens is that specimens come through to us in multiple pieces belonging to one individual, and we have to rebuild or reconstruct these fossils. What we do in those instances is we use a special conservation glue or adhesive known as Paraloid B72. Paraloid B72 is a polymer plastic. So what it means is it's a plastic that one can um, uh, soften or liquefy either through heat or acetone. In our case here at the museum, we like to use acetone because acetone allows us to create different um, consistencies or viscosities of the adhesive we want to use. So using different ratios of um, the paraloid with the acetone allows us to create very thin consistencies or very thick consistencies, depending on what we need to use them for. So we'd use the thick consistency to glue together pieces of broken bone, very similar to a jigsaw puzzle. So it's almost like prehistoric jigsaw puzzle building that we do here in the lab. And that allows us to fix and repair skulls so that we can send them through to our collection in as a complete condition as possible. Here we have the skull of a coyote. And you can see it was in lots of small pieces and we were able to rejoin these and rebuild what we have of this back part of the coyote skull. This is where the neck would connect, this is the back area. And now we can send it through to collections. As you know, when you are doing glue projects, often when you are applying pressure to join two pieces together, excess glue oozes out. And we want that to happen here and we allow it to dry. Once it's completely dry and set, we just use undiluted acetone and we just gently clean off that excess glue so that we make it pretty when we send it through to our collections team. And that is all the work that we do with our large fossils here in the lab. So these are the stages of fossil preparation. But remember I mentioned to you that the collection of sediment that we have with all the potential microfossils in, we also have to look at that and separate all those microfossils from the sediment so we can send that material over to our collections team. And I'm now going to show you a collection of these microfossils on the screen. So this screen is just um, highlighting what we find here, the screen is connected to a microscope. See over there. And exactly what you are seeing through the eyepieces of the microscope is what's represented here on the screen. For any of you that have a one cent coin around, I put the one cent coin in the corner just to provide some indication of scale. And you can see the O-N-E 
on the screen. So it just shows you how tiny these microfossils are. I'm just going to point out what you're looking at. Over here, we have clamshell, freshwater clamshell. We have a seed pod, probably juniper. We have the vertebrae or backbone of a snake. Over here, this is a lizard lower jaw with all those egg-like teeth. This is a mouse toe bone. We have bird claw over here. We have the tooth, the cheek tooth of a wood rat or pack rat. We have the insect leg over there. And we have a small fragment of leaf. You can even see the venation beautifully preserved on this specimen of leaf. You'll notice that we get variations in color with our microfossils. And all of that is dependent on the biological materials or the makeup of the biological material and how absorbent of asphalt it will be. The more absorbent the biological material, the darker it will be in color. So the clamshell is made up of calcium carbonate, which is a very dense and tough substance. And because of that, asphalt cannot penetrate into it to stain it. But when we look at the insect leg, insect body parts are made up of chitin, which is a highly absorbent material. And because of that, it gets stained very dark by the asphalt, just because it can take up so much of the asphalt. Now we have gone through tons and tons of matrix here in the lab and sorted out all these microfossils and more than what is represented on the screen. And we often like to say that it is the small fossils that can answer the biggest questions here at Rancho La Brea or the La Brea Tar Pits. And that is because small fossils or animals such as um, lizards and insects and plants have a small home range. And what do I mean by that? When we are thinking about direwolves and mammoths, they have large home ranges, which means they can travel many miles a day and cross a lot of territory in search of food or water. And so if we find a dire wolf or a mammoth here, it's not necessarily to say that that dire wolf or mammoth was born and grew up here. But when we find these microfossils, we know that they're a lot more local. So an example would be where this seed pod germinates, it's going to be where that tree eventually grows and where that tree eventually ends up being trapped in the asphalt. So by understanding what microfossils we have, plants and insects and mammals and lizards and even our freshwater remains, we have a little bit of fish in our collection as well, this can help us reconstruct the ancient environment for understanding what it looked like here at Rancho La Brea in Los Angeles, specifically 10 to 50,000 years ago. And these are not necessarily always the answers we can find from our large fossils. So they are absolutely essential in being able to reconstruct an ancient ecosystem. And so even though they might be small, they are mighty in the data that they can provide to scientists here at the Tarpets. And yes, that is everything that we do here in this space on a daily basis before COVID. And we try and do it more regularly now that we can get back on site. And I really hope you all enjoyed this insight and overview to what it is that we do here in the lab. And yes, I'm happy to answer any questions there might be. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steph. We have a ton of great questions here for you. So I'll just dive right in. Um, let's see. So Zamal's wondering, um, he says, you know, skin makes a huge difference on how a species may look. How do you make a visual on a primitive or an ancient animal, um, what it might look like with just the fossils? So f they're saying, for example, we all have similar looking bones, but it's our skin that can really make us look distinctive and diverse. So they're wondering, you know, how can we use the fossils to kind of get a, a visual of what these animals might look like? That is an excellent question. So firstly, 
we don't have any skin or hair or soft tissue preserved here at the tarpits. And the reason for that is because there's quite a lot of microbial activity in the asphalt and it uh, breaks down soft tissue elements such as skin and hair. But what we do have is we have a lot of representation in our fossil record where we still find animals that are similar today. So an example could be the mammoth. A mammoth is a proboscidean, which means it's the same as elephants from Africa or Asia. And by understanding how the skin and uh, the, the, the biology of an uh, African elephant or an Asian elephant works or looks, we know that it would have represented something potentially similar to that. The same for the dire wolf with our living wolves, the same for the same two cats with lions and other cats that we have around today. Sloths are a bit of a mystery uh, because there is nothing living today that even remotely resembles the ground sloth, which is something that makes them quite a bit of a mythical but fantastic creature that we have here. However, in some areas where we do find ground sloth remains, like in dry caves in the Nevada, in the Nevada desert or in Chile, or even some of the uh, this material that's been found in the Anza Borrego Desert, they have been able to find skin. Here is a picture of sloth skin, looking at the inside of the skin, but on the outside, you can see these little tufts of hair, fur. And so different ways of preserving things, like I said, these are in dry cave desert environments where things can get mummified. Um, we can use that to help build and reconstruct what these ancient creatures skin or biology looks like and then also even though bones are very similar um, when scientists reconstruct the skeletons when they have all the bones like the style will be behind me you can get a good idea of exactly how that animal's posture was and by understanding certain aspects of these bones you can even find out uh, how fast it ran um, was it an ambush predator? Was it a, a predator that liked to hunt its prey down? We can also look at the teeth, and the teeth can tell us a lot about how, uh, firstly, if they're carnivores or herbivores, and potentially what kind of food they ate as well. I hope that answers the question. I think so. So scientists basically use several different techniques in reconstructing these, right? We'll look at at animals that are related, like you were mentioning with the mammoth and elephants, and then also looking for other evidence, like the scientists who were able to find the sloth skin. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Kind of similar to this uh, uh, sloth that you mentioned, someone is wondering what your favorite fossil is that you get to work on. So my favorite fossil is actually a part of the sloth's uh, skeleton. Um, and it's these little bones that are called osteoderms or dermal ossicles. You can see there's a little collection of these bony nuggets. I'll take a few out so that I can show you what they look like. You can see they're not very big. For an animal that was larger than a Mini Cooper, um, these were found inside the skin, these dermal ossicles. So that's exactly what the word dermal ossicle means. Dermal, or derm. derma is skin, bones. And again, I'm going to show you this picture that I showed you just a moment ago. Do you, if you see all these little white dots inside the skin, those are the dermal ossicles. And what was the function or purpose of these dermal ossicles in the sloth skin? Well, it almost served uh, the same as a knight's armor. It was an extra layer of protection for this animal against predators such as the saber-toothed cat and the dire wolf. And why it is my favorite is that I have never, ever seen bones like that in my life before until I started working here at the La Brea Tarpet. You find these kind of dermal ossicles in uh, uh, reptiles, lizards and crocodiles have them, but I've never seen them in a mammal before. And the only modern comparison to it today is probably the armadillo. And so because of that, it's, it's one of my favorite fossils. That's awesome. It's such a neat animal to be learning about. Um, we've got another question here. Kimberly is wondering, how did you start 
working with fossils and what were you always interested in them? Yes, um, so I grew up in South Africa and lived very close to an area called the Cradle of Humankind, which is where there are tons of fossil sites that have yielded remains of our human ancestors. Uh, I then uh, started to volunteer at the local museum and got very interested in it. I then did a dual major in anthropology and archaeology, and I spent about 17 years in South Africa working with fossil sites and uh, chemical preparation of these ancient uh, humans, uh, which are known as hominins. And then um, always been interested and fascinated with the La Brea Tar Pits. If you're interested in paleontology anywhere in the world, you know about the La Brea Tar Pits. So when I saw the job opening for this position, I just had to apply because it is a dream to work here at this institution with these fantastic fossils. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, we've got maybe one more question here. We've got a few students who are wondering, are the fossils behind you and the ones that you were showing us, are those real? Everything I showed you in the lab today is real, except for this Smilodon that is a cast or a replica and the mammoth lower jaw. But they are exact replicas of the original thing. And the reason why I have these as replicas and not the original is just because the original mammoth jaw would be too heavy for me to carry on my own and I'm alone in the lab today. So it's easier to bring out the replica. And then also our saber tooth cats are very fragile and we can't mount them like this to give you a good um, idea of how the gaping mouth looked. So I used um, the castle replica for that. But everything else, the dye wolf and all the fossils I've showed you today are all original fossil material. And that's why I wanted to do it from inside the fossil lab so that you feel that you are getting to experience an authentic presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steph. This has been so fascinating to get another peek inside the lab and see what all you do all day. And um, I'm really excited, too, to see the next episode. Do you want to tell us a little bit about maybe what, we're, what we'll talk about more specifically in that one? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so today was a basically a general overview of what we do in the lab. And moving forward for the continuation of the series, um, we'll be discussing a bit more in depth the different aspects of these tasks that we mentioned. And so for the next episode, I'll be doing um, basically solvent preparation and how we remove asphalt. And I'll be able to talk about asphalt in a bit more detail and about the preservation of our fossils and the preparation techniques. Great. Awesome. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that one for sure. So thank you again, Steph, for joining us. Um, I'm going to... For joining me in the space today. Absolutely. This is so exciting to, again, to be able to see inside. Um, so I want to say thank you to all of our friends and all, all of the students who are joining us this morning. We learned so much about all of our fossil preparation. And again, we're looking forward to seeing Steph again on March 8th at 1030 a.m. Um, for this next episode of this of this series. So if you do want to see some more of our fossil preparators, you can give them a follow on Instagram. We are at the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, and you can also see all of our videos from these presentations and others on our YouTube channel, um, which is also on the screen here. You can search La Brea Tar Pits on YouTube. So thank you all again for joining us. We hope to see you again at the next Inside the Fossil Lab session, where again, Steph's gonna to talk to us a little bit more about cleaning our fossils. And again, that's gonna be on March 8th at 10.30. So ask your teacher or caregiver to sign you up and we'll see you then. Thanks so much for joining us. And also, if you didn't get your question answered during this session, hopefully we can get to it at the next one. So again, thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day. And we'll see you soon.